you can't stop till you touch the gate. And even though it sounds so simple, that that one sentence, it sticks with me till this day time. I went to a competition called the English Schools and I came away with a silver medal. So that's that's basically all the secondary schools in the country. Um, so I think the main one was for my um, when I had a huge seizure when I was younger. And um, it wasn't necessarily the diagnosis of epilepsy that made me struggle with everything. I think it was more a few years later, the, the psychological side of, of things that um, I had a lot of worry about having another seizure. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I guess that's probably a really nice place to start, Beth. So with regards to what you've been doing, I, I've been, like, obviously I had a look on your Instagram and stuff. Is it just the case now of, because athletics is, obviously you're not getting the full spring of it, is it just the case of you sort of making things by your own means at home? Yeah, it has been. It's been um, weird because when we went into lockdown, the Olympics were still on. So when we went into lockdown, it was very much serious. You know, we need to have the right equipment. You know, we need to get everything as normal as possible. But actually, as the week's gone on and the Olympics got cancelled, then the Europeans got cancelled. And then the majority of the Diamond League has been either cancelled or postponed. It's been a case of, do you know what? We actually need to hold back a bit. Um, we don't need to go all guns blazing because there's no Olympics, there's no major championships this year. So for me, it's been a case of trying to kind of maintain fitness but not push it um, until we know for a definite where the season is going. And so with these championships and stuff like that not taking place, how does that affect you mentally? Sort of obviously with, you know, competitions potentially coming up, you maybe improving a time or doing whatever. How does that impact you mentally? It's tough because kind of your major championships is everything that you aim towards and everything else is just a building block towards that. And so now you've not got that big goal to aim for. So it is really tricky. But for me, I think that just kind of gives you a chance. It takes the pressure off. You can kind of enjoy racing without that pressure of, I need to run this time, I need to run that. You can just do it, see where you're at. And for me, it everything just shifts so that the focus is now Tokyo 2021. Um, so everything that I do this year, it won't be necessarily to see what I can run this year. It's just to put a good base in so that next year when the Olympics comes round, I've not missed a whole year of racing. So for me, I definitely do want to get some races in this year to put me in a good position for next year. And is it kind of nice, obviously, get being in that sort of world of, I mean, I presume you've done this from when you were a tot, being in, yeah. you know, being in athletics and all this sort of stuff. Is it kind of nice right now to have that break? Um. It is and it isn't. I mean, for me, it was really devastating that the Olympics did get cancelled because I felt like I was in good shape. And, you know, it it kind of just, it felt like my momentum was just knocked over, basically. But now you can work on your weaknesses. You can reset. Um, and it's kind of non-stop in athletics. You're always training for something and you get very little downtime. Um, so it is quite beneficial to have that downtime to work on your weaknesses and you've got an extra year to prepare for next year so that when you start training next year you shouldn't run into any injuries because you've got a really good chance to kind of rehab or prehab as you call it to get kind of a hold on them now. And what was the team looking like for Tokyo? Was it a strong team? Yeah I think it would have been a really strong team. There are a lot of athletes that are uh, like in their prime at the moment and for them especially my heart really goes out to them because we kind of in athletics you kind of hung hang medals around people's neck before they've even done it um, and there were a lot of athletes that I thought that you know could have really gone to the Olympics and came away Olympic champion and I think that's the hardest part for everyone the fact that just because you're an Olympic champion in 2012 doesn't mean you're going to be an Olympic champion in 2013. Athletics changes every single year. So it may well be that we get to 2021 and there will be some athletes that have missed out on becoming an Olympic champion because they were in great shape this year and next year they're not, they might not be in that shape. Um, and I think that is kind of tough to deal with because you build up for this for years. It's it's not always just four years. It can be a long, long time. 
and obviously Olympics are every four years and you're typically going to only get one that you're in the shape of your life for and for those athletes that Tokyo was that it's it's really really heartbreaking for them was that do you think that was going to be your prime as well yeah I mean I felt that I had um I kind of broke through onto the scene in 2018 and had a really good year then and then last year struggled with loads of injuries and it was kind of out of the blue for me because I didn't really struggle with injuries prior to that um but then this year I felt so much more like myself training was going better than ever and I just felt in amazing shape and that's why it was so difficult when the Olympics were being cancelled I think if this was last year and I'd had all these injuries I wouldn't have been as bothered it would have almost been a relief because I knew I wasn't in shape but when you know you're in shape it's it is really difficult because um you you want to you've prepared all year for something and the training we do is is gruesome it's not like you know a bit here and there it is a lot of pain and when it got cancelled it was just like oh I put myself through all that pain I got myself in really good shape. I've been so focused. I've not seen my friends or family this year. I've been really, really committed. You know, turning down all these things that your friends go to without you, um, all those commitments, and then the competitions aren't even there, and that's the reason you do it. So it's it. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that you sacrifice, and then when that's taken away from you, it is really difficult. So how do you obviously with that? shape that you're in you just said you're in unbelievable shape as in you know the best shape of your life so how when in lockdown have you been able to sustain that that's the thing that's the tricky thing because it's with all the tracks are closed so for me running fast you can only really do it with your spikes on a track it's not the same you know just tying your trainers up and running on the grass or the concrete is completely different so the majority of my sessions, not all, but the majority have been on the tra- uh, on the grass. So it's quite tricky to maintain that. Um, but fortunately, now the government guidelines have changed. We are looking that the, the tracks will be open. We don't know when yet, but it, it, elite athletes are allowed to return to training. So that should mean that um, tracks will be open. And I know people are working on that. Um, so hopefully it's not too much longer because... You can kind of get away with missing a few weeks, but when you start to miss months um, of being on the track, that that's when it gets really difficult. So if we take this all the way back, we're going to go completely in reverse here, Beth. So why did you first get into it? Um, I think I was always a sporty child and um, I really loved running. Um, when I was really young, uh, well, my dad, he used to play football, so he was really like active. Um, and sporty and he retired quite late so I remember him doing like loads of exercise around the house and he used to go for runs every weekend and um, I somehow got into going with him and he just he really really pushed me and it was uh, the way I would describe it is it's that pain you get from exercise that's a horrible feeling but also a really like satisfying feeling at the same time and I learned that from a young age and then I kind of just fell in love with that and I joined Doncaster Athletics Club and never really showed that much promise as a young athlete. But kind of as I've got older, I've um, done a lot better and my career's really taken off. But I would say exercising, if I go for those runs with my dad when I was younger, really, really sparked that, that fire for me, loving exercise. See. You were just speaking about your dad there, Jim Dobbin. So obviously played for clubs like Celtic. So he was at a really very good level. So obviously you were just talking about that helping you. Was there sort of an added expectation that maybe hindered you in some front? Um, I think that's where I've been really, really lucky. My parents have, they've always supported me. They've always encouraged me, but they've always just let me get on with it. And it's, and it's always been my choice. It's never been them saying to me, oh, come on, Beth, you need to get ready. You're going to be late for training. It's always me saying, dad, come on, you need to set off. We need to set off. I want to go to training. It's always been the other way around. And I think looking back, uh, I kind of look back at my career at Doncaster and um, some parents were really, really heavily involved. And I wouldn't say mine were. They would come and watch me compete um, when it was local, but they weren't heavily involved. And I think for me, that has been the best thing ever because I wasn't pushed into doing it because I am quite the the type of person, if someone was pushing me to do something, I'd probably do the opposite. So that has definitely helped 
in a sense, the fact that even though I know that they're supporting me, they're not like pressuring me to do anything. And was there sort of like when you were younger, obviously you talk about that feel from exercise. I think a lot of people who probably watch this podcast can relate to that. It does give you those endorphins. So, but was there sort of a defining moment, maybe a race, maybe some, a conversation that sort of you remember when, when you were first getting into athletics? Um, I think that going back to the runs with my dad, we used to go for these crazy runs. We'd go everywhere and, and then we'd, we'd live on a hill and we live in the middle of the hill and we'd always run back up the hill. And I remember dad, my dad saying to me, no, you can't stop till you touch the gate. And even though it sounds so simple, that that one sentence, it sticks with me till this day. So when I'm doing, I might be doing my ab exercises and I might have 20 to do no, you can't stop till you get to 20. Whereas a lot of people might think, oh, I'm on 16, you know, my tummy's burning, that'll do. I've always said, no, you can't stop till you get to that. So I think that really kind of defined my work ethic. And then in terms of like my athletics, I think when I was a bit older, um, I think I was about 16 at the time, I went to a competition called the English Schools and I came away with a silver medal. So that's that's basically all the secondary schools in the country competing against each other. And then for me to come away being the second fastest of all those girls my age, it really did give me a sense of, oh, I, I actually might not be too bad at this. Like, I actually might be all right. Um, you know, just work hard. And, and when you get that kind of buzz and feeling of doing so well and everyone's congratulating you, it becomes a bit addictive and you want more and more of that so that then motivates you to train even harder and how did you balance obviously you have been consistently in athletics but how did you manage to balance with academia did you still have that same drive that you had for athletics with academia or was it a little bit different I, I think I, I wouldn't say it was as high I wanted to do well at school and um, I wanted to get good grades and and I think for me, the big driver was I wanted to get the gate grades to go into Loughborough because I knew that would be a good place for my athletics. So it was always there in the background. But I think kind of I, an athlete's personality is quite dedicated and quite, um, you know, once they've set their mind to something, they want to really do well at it. So I always had that, you know, that focus and, you no, know, you can stop when you've done X amount of pages of your revision book. So it is very much it I do think it helps you set goals for other areas of your life and how was Loughborough I loved Loughborough um, and I mean I'm still living here now so I can't I can't really thank Loughborough enough though it's been amazing and I think the facilities are just second to none you know the gyms are amazing the tracks are amazing and I'm really lucky that I met my coach this was eight years ago now that I'm still with today um, and he kind of took me under his wing as a young athlete when I was running a lot slower than I am now and kind of each year chipped away at my times um, and kind of got down to where I am now. So I, I really do have like so many ha good thought memories being at Loughborough and I'm still here now. So I don't know when I'll leave, probably when I retire, but yeah, I've, I've really loved being at Loughborough. Because there's not much there, is there? No, see, that's the thing. <laughs> Everyone, everyone says it's like a bubble and there's not many distractions. You know, you can you can just focus on your training. And I think that's what I love about it. There's, it's not that big city um, lifestyle where, you know, you can go out to a different restaurant every day. It's not that at all. You can go out to one a week and that's your limit in Loughborough. Um, so, yeah, it's it's but it, that makes it really good for sports in general because you're focused you're not distracted about going out all the time and does it ever you were talking about having your coach for such a significant period of time there speaking to other athletes there's been points in their lives where they've thought about chopping and changing coaches because that level they want to get to that level so much did you ever think about doing that in in any negative times or was it always the case that this person knows exactly what I'm about we will get there together in the end I think because I've been really lucky that the majority, I think every year I've raced under the, my coach now, I've run a PB. So when you're in that situation, you don't really feel the reason to leave because I'm a big believer of it. It's not broke, don't fix it. Um, so because I was always running well and never really ran into problems, I was just chipping away at it. I never really felt, felt the sense to leave. Um, and I know a lot of athletes they, they do chop and change coaches quite a lot. And then it doesn't always work 
work out for them. And I think in this country, the most successful athletes that we've seen um, that I can think of, like through my generation, like Jess Ennis, and obviously Dina's doing really well at the moment. And they've all been with their coaches since a young age. And that can be really beneficial because your coach knows you really, really well inside out. But then obviously saying that, you shouldn't just stick with a coach if things don't feel quite right or if you feel like it's not working for you. But I am a big believer if, if you feel it's working, you shouldn't leave unless it's got to a point where it's not working anymore. So if you're getting PBs year on year on year, how do you go about that? Is it Because we always hear in the media, how it's 70% nutrition, 30% exercise or whatever the outcome is. Is that just... Uh, a change in sort of training or is that a change up in your nutrition how do you keep getting from level to level to level I think it's um a bit of everything really so I think for me the main thing has been changing strength so when I moved to Loughborough eight years ago I'd never been in a gym before um I was very very like skinny really and um each year I've just really really worked at getting stronger it doesn't come naturally to me which sounds weird because I am a sprinter but I feel like I've got really good endurance and stamina but the strength side is something I struggle with so every year I've always kind of set myself goals right you need to get stronger in this lift this lift and this lift and then you'll be kind of stronger overall and that I think definitely has kind of related to my performances on the track but then saying that I have always been on top of like my nutrition and my sleep. Um, so yeah, I think it's just getting something that works for you and doing it really, really consistently. And if you do that, you should see improvements um, year on year. Have you, uh, do you ever, I mean, this is from a personal thing as well. Do you ever think that you can get your nutrition absolutely spot on? You can get your training absolutely spot on. But if you don't get that right amount of sleep, you're completely written off. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that I think is very independent to like individual to every athlete. So um, in 2018, I was working um, crazy hours at the same time as doing my athletics career. I had um, a receptionist job. And that year I just got kind of used to having like five or six hours sleep every night. Um, and still running really well whereas now if I was to get that amount of sleep I would not function that the next day so I think you can kind of almost train your body to do what you're used to and that obviously leads me on to quite a nice one so what what difficulties have you found throughout your career has there been any that sort of stand out um so I think the main one was for my um, when I had a huge seizure when I was younger and um, it wasn't necessarily the diagnosis of epilepsy that m- made me struggle with everything. I think it was more a few years later, the, the psychological side of, of things that um, I had a lot of worry about having another seizure. So that that really took away um, a year of my athletics career, really, because I was I was so worried I wasn't eating or sleeping right. I was just really, really anxious that I was going to have another seizure. Um, and that is something that it did take me quite a while to get over. So I'd say that was kind of one of the the big difficulties. Um, and obviously I touched upon working crazy hours in 2018. That that wasn't nice. And the year before I was doing the same. Um, and I think as athletes, we train for like four to five hours every day. And if you've done an eight hour shift before that, it's just not, it's just not a pretty sight. When you get to training, you go, you're exhausted. It's hard to find the motivation. So you can kind of physically just get through all the hard stuff, but then it's really hard to find the motivation to do the little like one percent as they call it. So making sure you're doing all your stretches. So that was really difficult. And I think um, last year I did have a, a, a really difficult year in terms of injuries. It just felt like everything I did, I was just getting injured. So I, I had a freak accident in the gym where I, I, I dropped um, 60 kilos on my neck and chipped a bone in my neck. So that wasn't fun. And I had um, a knee injury and um, just loads of little niggles that no one really knew what was going on. And I think that was just, I had the season of my life in 2018 and had made huge jumps. And I think in 2019, my body was just, kind of what have you done to me why have you made me run run this fast when I'm not used to it um so it was really just get, 
think it was just getting used to the fact that I've progressed a lot more and I maybe need to change my training to, to kind of adapt to the, the speeds that I'm running at now. With 200 metres, I, I tried to do it when I was at school. <laughs> Not very successfully, but I tried. I, I genuinely think it's the hardest race because it, it, obviously with 400, I'm not, 400 metres, I'm not taking it out, but it seems like it's sort of like a 70% run the whole way around, which is difficult. It's difficult in itself, but 200 metres, I always got to the 100 metre mark and I was absolutely exhausted. So how how are you able to, How is that just the training methods that you're able to get? Or do you think it's a bit of an innate ability that your muscles are just readied and powered to get to that 200 metre mark and as quick as possible? Yeah, I think for me, I would say the the 200 metres is definitely like genetic or innate because I think you can have speed, you can have as much speed in the world, but if you haven't got that strength to finish the last 50 metres strong, you kind of, it's it's a very long way for you. Um, And I don't, I think there's training you can do to improve that, but I think you do have to have that naturally. And, And I would say I definitely haven't got, the flat speed that some girls who I race have um and I managed to kind of beat them or or run a lot closer to them than I would in the 100 just from having that strength at the finish which is something I'm really lucky to have and and I do think it's a case of you can you can improve it but you do need to have that natural kind of strength stamina to to your kind of makeup and I do think doing all those long runs with my dad when I was younger might have contributed to that as well. So would you say you think you get stronger when you get to that last 100 metres? Yeah, definitely. So I always come off the bend and I think, oh my God, what have I done here? I've messed this up big time. They they were all like a metre or so at least in front of me, but I've got a really good ability to just stay relaxed. And then the last 50 metres, I will then come through. Um, and that's really, really lucky to have. And I am, I am working on like my flat speed to come off the bend a lot closer to them. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's something that when I'm on, when I've done that first hundred meters and I'm on the home straight, I just feel really comfortable and like, right, this is your, this is the part of the race that you're good at now. Um, and so I just feel really relaxed. So I guess that's that's good in a way. So that's really interesting, Beth. So it look, it seems like even when you're just talking about it there your last 100 is so strong and you seem really confident but that first 100 is that something sort of you and your coaches are working on now because I I, I mean I assume if you're able to get to that peak in the 100 meters that first 100 meters you'd be I mean you'd be absolutely flying even more yeah it's definitely something that we're working on I know like a lot of especially the world-class girls they all run kind of 11 lows for the 100 and I'm more 11 mid so we've been trying to work and get my flat speed down um and I do think that if I get it down significantly that will help but I then I'm I'm still aware of you do need to play to your strength as well so there have been years where I've I, I mean 2018 was a classic example we really kind of just thought you know what your speed just isn't really improving that much we'll work on your strength and that in turn then improved my speed just by getting more stamina and stronger so it's very weird how you do have to play to your strengths um, and too much speed doesn't kind of always suit me as a runner. So with the strength exercises is that more of a build-up in the legs or is it a build-up throughout the entire body how do you go about strengthening the body for a 200 meter sprinter? Um, So I think it's kind of doing over distance stuff. So stuff that's longer than the actual 200 meters, because if you can get used to that, then you can get used to the 200 meters. So that's kind of it from the endurance point of view. I think the strength in the gym point of view, that, that almost helps your speed, or I feel that that helps me improve my speed. So I think the main thing is just if, if you're, if you run 200 in 22 seconds, make sure you're doing, um, like maybe 250s or 300s I do quite a lot of them running that over distance to help work on the finish of my race and you uh, d- uh, make me uh, interrupt me if I'm wrong here but have you improved your time from 2018 to 2019 was it by is it nearly a second yeah so it was um 2017 to 2018 so I'd gone from 23.3 to 22.5 which is yeah eight tenths so 
in in sprinting, I think that's that's huge. Um, and I can't really think of many people that kind of have a jump like that. Um, and yeah, it was it was a real shock, even to just just get sub twenty three, like twenty two nine, twenty two eight. That would have been a huge shock. Um, but to take it to twenty two mid, that it was it was a real shock. And and you kind of you, you go through the season thinking what is going on, and then at the end of the season you're thinking how how have I done that? Um, but now I'm a bit more like used to running those times. I backed it up a lot because the first time I did it, I thought, oh, that was it. That was a fluke. <laughs> but you hit your, so that was your record time in July 2019. So, yeah. Yeah. so that's, that's been your, 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 your right now. That's your PB. So what's your, what's your next goal? Um, I think I would like to, I, I mean, everyone wants to just run as fast as they can, but if I could, keep going the way I'm going in PB every year I would love to you know take my time down to 22.40 from 22.50 and then kind of as I'm getting older go to the major championships get myself in the finals and get myself some medals and that would be the dream whether that's you know relay or individual that is definitely something I want because a lot of athletes my age have got some I've got medals behind them and I don't have any major medals to my name yet so I really want to make a name for myself in the relay and also um, get myself in some individual finals at an Olympic and world level. What's the training schedule going up to what does that to the Olympics look like or what did it look like going up to the Tokyo Olympics? Yeah so it's um, it's hard work so I train five times a week um, I see the physio twice a week and we might do three running sessions a week and two to three gym sessions a week. So it is a lot of time spent at the track kind of perfecting things, especially now that I've got to a level where um, I feel like the, there's only so much further I can go um, in terms of times that it's, you know, there's not that much I, I can't keep taking a second off my time or that would just be impossible so you have to work on like the little things so we're working in on my weaknesses and trying to improve my technique I've got a few technical flaws that hopefully can help my time overall so it, it really is just working on the one percent at the moment and um, while I'm still young and and trying to just get as quick as possible as I can. When you were younger did you ever feel like with the athlete scene and and where you were going and the projected level that people saw you at did you ever think that you were missing out on on some of your teenage years yeah that i think for me that has been the hardest part of athletics what you actually or sport in general what you actually miss out on because you really can't do the the things that a normal teenager or normal early 20s would do in terms of meeting up with your mates you can't go on all the girls holidays in the middle of summer like if you to go on holiday it's have it has to be in September when all the races are done so you miss out on so much but for me um I would I would never forgive myself if I you know went to all these parties and went out every weekend and didn't make the sacrifices because for me my athletics is a lot more important than nights out and and holidays and there will be plenty of time for that whenever I retire so it's been a no-brainer, I would say, but it, it does sometimes get hard when because the majority of my friends are normal people. They're not like elite athletes, so and they do go out a lot and they're always meeting up and going on holidays and I'm not there. So that is quite difficult, but you just have to remind yourself of the goal and, and if I can walk away from this sport um, running as fast as I possibly can, hopefully become an Olympian, have some medals behind me, that the sacrifices will have all been worth it. Yeah, you can wait for that night out in Donny and Loughborough a little bit later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, um, did you meet even from like a young age, obviously with your dad sort of being in that environment and even just when you were getting into that athletics and up to now obviously being in Loughborough, at Loughborough, at Loughborough did you ever, have you met anybody who was completely taking, taking your breath away, starstruck, anything like that? Yeah, I, uh, I remember... I met Jess Ennis several times and um, so we competed at the same competition I think this was in 2011 or it maybe even 2012 um, and I remember asking for my photo with her and I could barely speak and then moving to Loughborough it was just full of elite athletes and I would get like so nervous my heart would pound when they came over and I was like so starstruck and um, it took me a while to get used to it and then me and my coach we used to go to Sheffield 
um, and do some sessions indoors because they've got an indoor track there. So when it, the weather was cold um, and we wanted to do longer stuff. And my coach was good friends with Jess Ennis. And he was like, oh, Jess, come over and meet my athlete. And I was like going bright red, can barely talk because I was like 18 at the time. And I just remember just being so starstruck. And, and definitely so many athletes that I'm now on the teams with um, for GB, I used to like really be wowed by them. And now to be on teams with them, you know, chatting away with them, it is a real surreal feeling. Is there a, can you tell there's a mindset with them as well? Like just sort of a determined mindset? Yeah, definitely. And I think what's most remarkable is they're actually just so normal as well. Like they're no different to kind of other athletes um, that maybe aren't at that level. They're, I think a lot of athletes have that same determined attitude. Um, but being on teams with them, it's really like interesting to see how they prepare and how they kind of take it to the next level when they're at the major championships. But yeah, the majority of the time, they're just so normal, lovely people. If you could go back, this is what we ask everyone, Beth. If you could go back and do something or improve something in your life, what would it be? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I would, I mean, I don't know if I can change this, but I would like to have kind of broke onto the athletic scene a bit younger. So I had my breakthrough, I think I was 23 at the time. And I don't know what I could have done to change that, but I would have loved for it to be kind of a, even just a couple of years younger because then I felt, I feel like I would have um, got more years out of the sport at an elite level and maybe achieved more in the sport because I've got more years at an elite level. So for me, yeah, I would have liked to break on the scene a bit earlier, but it might mean that my career is a bit longer um, and I might run when I'm a bit older than some athletes because I did have a, a later peak. So yeah, that would be my one change, I think. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Well, thank you, Beth, and uh, we'll see you later. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening, guys. That was the first ever episode of the In Full Swing podcast. We've got so much more to come. And if you wouldn't mind, if you are on Spotify, if you are on Apple Music, make sure you leave a five-star review, and we'll see you in a bit.